be at 7 p.m. I call the uh, Standing Committee on Finance uh, meeting here in the Council Chambers to order. Welcome everybody here. Welcome councillors. Do you want to indicate uh, Council Azak did contact me and indicated uh, that she had a previous commitment and could not be here this evening for, for this meeting. At this point in time, we'll start with our first item, order number one, Madam Clerk. Actually, um, Mr. President, could I? <coughs> Councilor Barnes. Could I ask that we uh, take number 19 out of order, and I propose that we table this uh, until further notice? Second. Okay. Motion been made in the second. <coughs> we take number 19 out of order. All in favor? Opposed? And you're going to ask that it be tabled? Yes, I, I move that we table number 19, please. Second. second. Motion has been made in the second that we table item number, number 19. All in favor? Proposed number 19 has been tabled. Thank With that being said, we'll go back to item number one, Madam Clerk. That the city hereby accepts and expends the grant award in the amount of 10000 from Mass Humanities to the City of Brockton in support of Stride Toward Freedom Together, connecting Brockton's diversity by exploring our common ground. The grant is to be matched by at least 2000 in cash and 9900 in in-kind services. The mayor is authorized to execute any and all documents necessary to effectuate such grant. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conan, Chief Financial Officer. Council Bonds. Uh, Mr. President, uh, we have actually Lynn Smith here who actually wrote the grant and was awarded the grant for the Frederick Douglass um, Neighborhood Mass Humanities Program. And in the last few days, she recently told me that they were awarded another $500. So after she does her presentation, I'm going to make a motion that we amend this particular order and add the $500. Thank you, Council. And just so everybody knows that uh, Lynn was not down as one of the invitees, but I don't have a problem with uh, her speaking in, in regards to this uh, particular item. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lynn Smith. I serve as the treasurer of the Frederick Douglass Neighborhood Association. You may remember High Street, the old <coughs> High Street, which runs from Main Street to Warren Avenue, <coughs> was renamed Frederick Douglass Avenue back in 2004 to honor one of America's greatest civil rights leaders, Frederick Douglass. And on that street stood our Liberty Tree, a sycamore tree that we believe was planted in 1763. That tree stood outside the stables of Edward Bennett, who was a Brockton abolitionist. His stable was a stop on the Underground Railroad leading up to the Civil War. So the Frederick Douglass Neighborhood Association, which was founded in 2014, is made up of Brockton citizens and residents and volunteers who honor the legacy of Frederick Douglass through community involvement, community spirit, and the arts. We're the folks who brought the little free libraries uh, that you see on the corners in downtown Brockton. This prestigious Mass Humanities grant of $10,000 will allow us this fall to host a community conversation in the War Memorial Building, and that is the city's only cost to this grant. They graciously waived the rental fee for the building for that community conversation. So four scholars from our community, Dr. Joe, Joe Rosa of Bridgewater State, um, Lee Farrow of Stonehill, Willie Wilson, and Monsieur Charlot Lucien will lead a conversation about our continuing work towards justice and equality. And the life of Frederick Douglass is interesting because it connects so many of the cultures in our city. You know, Frederick Douglass served as the minister to Haiti. You know, Frederick Douglass, when he came up to freedom as a slave, worked with the Cape Verdean shipbuilders in New Bedford. He stood next to Susan B. Anthony for women's rights, and he went to Ireland and fought alongside of Daniel O'Connell for the right of the Irish. So all of those connecting threads we'll talk about in our community conversation, and out of that, we're going to place historic signs in the Douglas Garden to honor freedom fighters from those cultures, Amilcar Cabral, Toussaint Louverture, Susan B. Anthony, Daniel O'Connell, Dr. Martin Luther King. So we hope that everyone in the city will come and join us in that conversation and then come and enjoy the garden. We are calling it the Stride Toward Freedom <coughs> Path because that was the name of Dr. King's book about the Montgomery bus boycott. 
You know, Frederick Douglass said, without struggle there is no progress. And Dr. King said, we may have come on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. And so we hope that the Brockton community will come and join us as we honor not only those past heroes, but search for the heroes in Brockton's future. Very good. Thank you. Councilors, any, uh, any questions? Councilor Barnes? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, at this time, I'd like to move to amend the $10,000 order and amend it to $10,500. Second. Second. Motion for made and second that we amend the amount of $10,000 and add to it the $500 to make it $10,500. All in favor of that amendment? All opposed? It goes uh, now. The now <coughs> is on sending it back to the full city council as amended for $10,500. All in favor? Opposed goes back to the full city council uh, amended to to make that reflection of the 10,500. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. and thank you to the council members who came to the Keith Park Flag Day picnic. And we invite you all to the Douglas Garden on June 28th for our next event, a very reading good. of Frederick Douglass in the Garden. Very thank good. you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do too. Thank you very much, <laughs> Madam Clerk. Item number two. Order that the DPW Commissioner is authorized to issue one single family home sewer connection for Lot 4 Ames Street, Book 44409, page 103, owned by Dennis Morrissey Family RT, invited Lawrence Raleigh, Commissioner DPW. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Commissioner. How are you? Good. Good. Yourself? Good, thank you. Um, I don't have any problems with this hookup. Motion. Second. Motion has been made. <coughs> Second. It goes back to the full city council. All in favor? Opposed? Goes back to the full city council. Um, favorably. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Councilor DiNapoli. Uh, I'd like to uh, move items 3 through 18. There's 16 orders here. They're all under, they all fall under Chapter uh, 44, Mass General Law. And they're what we do tonight is reestablish a, a revolving fund for the, for the monies that we receive. So I want, I'd like to do them collectively and, and waive the readings if it's possible. Second. <clears throat> Motions are made and seconded that we take items number three. Through, what number was Eight, it again? 18, Mr. Eight, Chairman. 18. Um, collectively. Exclude number 12. And we'll exclude number, we are going to exclude number 12 from okay. that. So you're going to okay. take again. 3 to 18 and exclude number 12, taking them uh, <coughs> collectively, and um, we will waive the uh, readings and they will be referred to the full city council uh, for next Monday night's meeting. All in favor of that? Opposed? Everyone's in favor of that? Okay. Um, item number 12, <coughs> Madam Clerk. <coughs> Order that the City Council of the City of Brockton, acting pursuant to Chapter 40Q of the Massachusetts General Laws, hereby approves the Downtown Brockton District, designates the City of Brockton Planning and Economic Department, directs the City of Brockton Assessing Department, and authorizes the Planning Department to take any other action in connection with the approval of the district. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, and Robert May, Planning Director. Good evening. Who do we have? Mr. Condon is here. Um, is Mr. May here? You want to? Um, I don't see him, Councillor, but I think he was uh, expecting to ask for postponement of this of this matter. And, and you know something, Mr. Condon, you are correct. And it escaped my mind. And I and I know that I believe he wants it. Second. Second. It'll be in the July finance meeting. All in favor of that? Opposed? That goes. That's been postponed to the July finance um, meeting. Mr. Chairman. Councilor Sullivan. I think just to dot the I's and cross the T's, number 19, even though it was tabled, the, uh, the actual resolve should, uh, verbiage should be read into the record. Number 19, we can read number 19 for the, for the record, even though it was uh, tabled, Madam Clerk. Resolve that Congressman Lynch come before a committee of this council to give a Washington, D.C. update invited Congressman Stephen Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Now we will go... Go back to, um, I guess we're back to 20. item number 20, am I correct? That's correct. Yes. Back to item number 20, Madam Clerk. 
Resolved that a representative from American Response AMR be invited to appear before the Finance Committee to discuss their past practices and operational endeavors over the past 30 years servicing the City of Brockton. Invited Marty Tyrell, Union Rep AMR, Tom McEntee AMR, and Stacy Hort AMR. Just as, um, excuse me, Council, just as Chairman, um, I, I do want to stick to what the resolve says, and it's in, it's talking about the operational endeavors of the of the um, past um, organization that was with the city for X amount of years, so I want to stay to what that resolve uh, is presently saying to us this evening. Councilor Sullivan. Chairman, thank you, uh, members of the Council Finance Committee. I filed this resolve. Uh, I thought it was appropriate. I thought it was uh, uh, the right thing to do to have AMR come before this body uh, as a service provider uh, for 30 plus years, the city of Brockton. Uh, it's uh, you know, it's, it's the right thing to do. We do that when we uh, have members of boards uh, that serve for a long period of time. Uh, the men and women that have served the citizens of the city of Brockton uh, that work for AMR uh, are true professionals. And uh, although this uh, council and this body has nothing to do with contract endeavors, I truly thought it was appropriate, Mr. Chairman, to file this resolve. So with that being said, the respective representatives from AMR. Just identify yourselves as you, as you speak. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is uh, Ron DeGrossier. I am the operations manager for American Medical Response here in Brockton in the northeast area. Um, I have a uh, prepared statement from the company, if, uh, if I could read that. Uh, as a longtime member of this community, I feel... Um, a, a real kinship with the citizens of Brockton. I have been uh, providing care here to your citizens uh, since 1981. And like you, I have a uh, vested interest in this city. Um, as, as you can see tonight, I'm not alone. I'd like to recognize uh, my brothers and sisters uh, in the EMS profession who are here also tonight. There are more than 100 total members of the AMR Brockton team that are also an integral part of this community. We have a deep, long-term relationship and have provided a critical public service to the citizens of Brockton for the past 34 years. Because of those relationships, we feel more like a member of the Brockton family than a provider or a vendor. And as you have seen from the multiple news stories and the demonstrations of support, um, from local citizens, healthcare professionals, and members of your own fire department, your constituents feel the very same way. It's obvious that the decision to cancel our contract after 34 years um, has hit a nerve with the citizens. I, I just want to remind you that we're not here to discuss the contract, so um, if you want to continue on just talking about your years of service here to the city, I would appreciate that, but nothing uh, in regards to the contract. Thank okay. you. Okay. Citizens do understand the importance of life-saving um, service we provide. Uh, they all understand the importance of visibility and the transparency in their local government. When, when city leaders make significant changes to a critical public service like the, EM, like the local EMS system, um, our commitments and our constituents want to know that the decision was made in an open and forthright manner. That, is what, that was made for all the right reasons and that when their lives are on the line, they can trust of you and elected leaders. You've already heard about the good work AMR has done in Brockton for the past 34 years. Uh, you have also heard about the union jobs that we now have at risk. Um, and you've just heard about how you are about to lose more than 30 years of experience and insight into an EMS system that we've devoted so much to. Obviously, the decision was not based on our performance. So as city leaders, you should ask, what was it based on? As you have already heard, the advisory board set up uh, to renew the proposals to provide ambulance service unanimously 
AMI was chosen. But did you know that uh, our regional CEO, Tom McEntee, had a verbal agreement with the mayor? Did you know that we have reached an agreement with the mayor to continue providing ambulance service to the city of Brockton? The mayor, the EMS advisory board. As far as I can see as chairman, and, and I'm in charge here, we're, we're talking about something that transpired that the city council does not have any control over. We do not sign contracts, nor do we in any way negotiate any type of a contract. I understand the situation and, and um, the dismay that the company may have, but I, I really want to keep it to what is before us, and that's talking about your years of service. Again, um, you know, we're, we're not in control of that, uh, that particular piece, and I don't want to get into um, those type of meddling of, of union situations. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if we could, uh, if we could, I do concur with you as chair, but if we could give a little leniency relative to the term operational endeavors, I think operational endeavors is all encompassing, uh, and you are talking about uh, a provider of 30 plus years in the city of Brockton. So much like to the deference when we have someone that wasn't reappointed to the ZBA or the planning board to come before us, we give them the, uh, the courtesy to express their feelings. That's the only form that they're able to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Basically, I'll, I guess I'll talk off the cuff here. <laughs> um, as I stated, I, I started here in 1981 when I was just an EMT. So that was the length of the contract. After Proposition 2.5 came in, the city went to a privatized service. And I got a job there. I worked as a dispatcher. I worked as... Um, a, a chair van operator, worked my way through all three levels of an EMT, and then now I'm at a level of the operations manager here in the city. And I, I've always been here, and I, along with these people here tonight, uh, are proud to have served the citizens and want to continue to serve the citizens of Brockton. We feel over 34 years We've implemented one of the best EMS systems possible. And as most physicians and nurses will tell you, with the finest providers in the land. We don't want to leave Brockton. And that's why we're fighting so hard that the mayor can reconsider this decision. We've in, we're embedded in the community. Our community out, outreach is impeccable. And we've <coughs> never said no to the city. In all the years that I've been here, we've always acted in the city's best interest. And we don't feel change is just necessary. And when it comes to EMS, you know, you're, you're not doing a contract here for fencing. This is an ambulance service. And is it the right time? July may not be the right time. It's very busy. And it takes years to establish a rapport within the community and with the fire department and police. It doesn't happen overnight. And that's why we are concerned. So I'd like to thank the council. Thank you. Thank you. And we respect your comments and we respect your service that you've had here in the city of Boston. Next speaker. Yeah. My name is Stacy Hort. I am Brockton born and raised. I have worked for AMR in Brockton as a paramedic for the last 16 years. I love my job and I love what I do. We've come before you tonight to show that AMR, based on past practices and operational endeavors, is the most qualified company to provide EMS to the city of Brockton. AMR has been providing EMS to the city of Brockton for many, many years. During this time, it has become apparent that more ambulances, quicker response times, and multiple locations are not <coughs> accurate measures of quality EMS, as has been suggested by Mayor Carpenter. Rather, experienced clinicians, area knowledge, consistent up-to-date training, equipment that enhances care and reduces injury, 
and interagency relationships have led to AMR's success as an EMS provider for all these years. More service by simply doubling the number of ambulances does not make a service more qualified to provide EMS. The level of staffing of those ambulances is what matters, and the decision on how to best staff them depends on the needs of the community and the residents. AMR has altered the configuration of its ambulances and staffing with each new contract <coughs> in order to provide the best quality EMS to the City of Brockton. The current RFP doubles the number of units from four to eight due to the increased volume of 911 calls. In addition to the added units AMR has recommended that there is a greater need for more ALS units and has offered to staff eight ambulances at the ALS level. Based on the review of thousands of run reports, that our providers have done. AMR has determined that a high percentage of patients require some level of ALS to ensure the best outcome in an emergency situation. AMR's recommendation is four double paramedic ambulances and four ambulances, each staffed with an EMT and an advanced EMT. Experience has shown that a high percentage of calls do not require paramedic level intervention. However, Experience has also shown that a unit staffed with two BLS providers reduces the quality of pre-hospital care in a critical patient. AMR is currently one of only a few service providers that recognizes and currently utilizes advanced EMTs on their 911 ambulances. While more ambulances may mean more service, it is the level of service that directs the patient outcome. Regarding response times, Studies have actually shown that shorter time spent on scene and transport to the most appropriate facility is what actually improves patient outcome. Paramedic tenure and cumulative experience is associated with those reduced on scene times and more consistent transportation to the appropriate facility. The ability to quickly determine the mechanism of illness or injury, efficiently treat the patient's condition, and determine the most appropriate point of entry will improve patient outcome. These skills are not taught, they are learned. As a side note, the National Fire Prevention Association recommends that ALS providers should arrive on scene within eight minutes. The National Registry of EMTs suggests that time is six minutes. AMR's dedicated ALS units have consistently averaged just over five minutes in response times. Having multiple locations does not make a service more qualified to provide EMS. Multiple locations usually mean that ambulances are strategically assigned to certain locations within the service area. There is no station and the crew is expected to remain in the ambulance for hours on end. This strategy, referred to as posting, can be detrimental to the outcome of patient care and to the overall health and well-being of the EMT. By running all of its ambulances out of a centralized location for many years, AMR has increased the skill retention of its employees by exposing all personnel to a variety of different calls. And it has limited those employees to high exposures in high risk areas. When posting, there is less chance for personnel to relax, de-stress, exercise, catch up on the paperwork, stock the ambulance, review cases with colleagues, and simply take care of human needs. There is a lot more to EMS than just running calls. For the most recent RFP process, Mayor Carpenter set up a review committee to rank each <coughs> service provider based on a set of criteria related to quality EMS. <coughs> AMR was ranked highly advantageous based on past practice and operational endeavors. However, AMR was somehow overlooked and this contract was awarded to another provider. The citizens are asking, why not AMR? The media is asking, why not AMR? The State Ethics Commission is asking, why not AMR? Mayor Carpenter has not offered any reasonable explanation as to why not AMR. And I believe tonight we have explained why AMR based on past practices and operational endeavors, we believe that we would provide the best quality and we do provide the best quality EMS to the city of Brockton. So in closing, <laughs> in, 
In closing, I would just like to thank all of you for allowing AMR to discuss the importance of past practice and operational endeavors in providing the best quality EMS to the City of Brockton. We believe that an unfavorable error was made in not awarding the contract to AMR. We believe that we are deserving of this contract. We have shown that experience is what allows us to succeed in EMS. Experience is what makes us quality providers. Experience is what matters. And an emergency medical services experience saves lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Marty Terrell. I'm a paramedic with AMR. I've been an EMT for 23 years, uh, paramedic for almost 19 now. <coughs> I've been working in the city of Brockton for 20 years. So I basically grew up in this field. First, I'd like to say that the people that I work with <coughs> are extremely humbling to me based on everything they've done over the years. It's amazing the quality of clinicians that we have in this city. And it's sad to see that we have to fight for the right to be able to care for those patients that you might necessarily want to pass on the street, see laying unconscious in a parking lot somewhere. These guys are fighting for that ability to be able to do that quality care. You know, I've also found that during this service, I actually learned my EMT class from Ronnie D back in 1991. EMT classes have been taught by AMR in the city of Brockton since at least 1989. <coughs> I don't know of any other system or classes that have been teaching for that long in this city. And also, with part of that education, we make sure our clinicians are at a higher quality. Most recently, we have EMT intermediates, or that mid-level ALS, advanced life support provider, upgrading to a new national standard called advanced EMT. We've taught two of those courses, a uh, transition course, in the city of Brockton for our providers as well as outside persons that were willing to come with us. We're the only ones in the eastern side of Massachusetts that have done that. And at this point, we have an over 90% pass rate on the first attempt when the national average for that is about 50%. So our people are putting a lot of quality, a lot of time studying, and they actually go well beyond what the minimum requirement is. With our central location, in the 34 years we've been in Brockton, in 1981, we started <coughs> out in a station next to Station 2 down on South Main Street, or down on Main Street. In 1989, there was a problem with the building, and we moved to the old Tip Top restaurant, which is where we are now, North Main Street. With regard to those response times, our guys consistently get there in 5 minutes, 12 seconds, 4 minutes, 58 seconds. Every month we have to send a report to the fire chief regarding that. And any time there's a response that's greater than six minutes, which is the national recommendation, there has to be accountability. We have to find out why that happens. What occurred wrong? What happened? And at one point we actually decided we were going to post some ambulances and see if that actually would minimize and save some time getting to a patient. We found that posting the ambulances wasn't warranted from our location and actually was detrimental to the provider's health because of increased back injuries. When you're sitting in an ambulance for 12, 24 hours a day on a street corner, Staples parking lot, say you're going to drive to Philadelphia, you're sitting in a car for 12 hours. How will you, by the time you get to Philadelphia, to be able to do your work, much less care for a cardiac arrest patient or carry them down a flight of stairs? How clean is your car by the time you get there? This is what's going to happen. And we realized that wasn't working for us. We quickly said, no, we have a central location. We're well below the national average. We just make sure our people are quicker getting out of the door, getting to their trucks, and ready to go at a moment's notice, which is why we implemented um, several radio backups. We have a, what's called a vocal alarm to alert the folks, so we don't have the lag time of making phone calls back and forth. We get notified as soon as we get dispatched uh, over the loudspeaker. We have knowledge of the service area. You can't find a street guide anywhere. They haven't been made in 10 or 15 years. The company that made it went out of business. Gave it to somebody else. They just reprinted it for a while without updating. We've actually transcribed <coughs> that street guide. We've fixed it, formatted it. 
adjusted it, added new streets as they've gone, and I actually maintain that file, and we print them out so that all of our trucks have those street guides. How able is your new responder going to be able to find that Dondi Road isn't anywhere near Dandy, Delmar, Dagmar, Dix, and Dixon, which we call the maze up in Station 7? Or what about Belcher Ave and Belcher Street? Or what about Goldfinch Way? Goldfinch Drive, I'm sorry. That's a new street that hasn't been added to even GPS at this point. Our guys know this. What about Hampton Ave? Hampton Ave, opposite ends of the city. Snell Ave, Snell Place, Snell Street. These guys need to know this. If I go to Snell Street and it's Snell Ave, somebody's going to die. And that's a concern. I've had to respond to the baby at the bottom of the pool or the cardiac arrest, the shootings. Time is sensitive. Another thing we have, experience levels. Our clinicians have an average of about 15 years experience. At this point, a concern for, for me personally is with the advent of the Quincy contract that everyone's heard about, they require six plus years of experience. You're going to get the leftovers. I do know, and my concern also is that we've had a higher quality assurance. We've had higher requirements, more stringent policies to make sure our providers are at the utmost quality. Because good enough is not good enough for us. We make sure that people do well above the minimum, which is what the mayor has suggested. Everybody made the minimum. Okay. My concern is that the providers that you do get are going to be those that we found to be not of the quality that was necessary in our beliefs to care for these citizens. <coughs> Would you rather have the box of seconds or the box of firsts? Again, our training is well above the minimum. Back in 2005 to 2009, we <coughs> ran a couple of cardiac studies in the city of Brockton. We didn't advertise it too much. Here is what we do. We did the EMS TIP EIS study, which is the Emergency Medical Services Time and Sensitive Predictive Instrument Study, where we calculated increased interpretations of 12 ECGs. What can we do to implement to reduce the door to balloon time in a cardiac catheterization? As one intervention, we found that just transmitting our EKGs to the hospital reduced the time from door to balloon by 10 minutes. As of July 1st, that's no longer the case. There's, uh, we also implemented increased training for our folks with 12 lead EKG interpretation. While yes, every paramedic has to have a minimum standard, day one, how comfortable <coughs> were you folks the first day you went into politics? Did you feel like you were ready for everything? Well, we have seasoned paramedics, seasoned providers who actually help mentor these folks. They're a safety net for these guys. I've had help teach. You know, as part of the studies, I help teach them the EKG things, uh, making sure that we have a higher interpretation assessment than what's the norm. Brockton was actually the first 911 system in the entire state to perform 12 lead ECGs pre-hospitally. We beat Boston by nine weeks. I was pretty proud of that. And our guys were able to find out somebody might be having a pulmonary embolus by looking at the 12 lead. They might be having left ventricular hypertrophy, all kinds of stuff. But it's, it's not required by the state. It's what we do. And we come back. <coughs> we'll tell each other, you know, hey, I have a good EKG. Take a look. What is this? And we start researching because that's what we want to do. We want to get better. But if I'm sitting in a parking lot, who am I going to ask? Um, also, the equipment that we use, we use automatic stretchers, the battery-powered stretchers, which have helped reduce back injuries significantly. That won't be the case. Our stair chairs have tracks on them to help reduce back injuries and provide increased safety for the patients going down a flight of stairs. That won't be the case. Our monitors, like I said, we can transmit. We use the Physio Control Life Pack 12s and Life Pack 15s. Both hospitals invested in base stations, which actually can receive the transmissions. When we transmit an EKG, believing somebody might be having a heart attack, it goes to the emergency room physician as well as to the cardiologist who's the inter interventionist. So they're on their way before we even start transporting our patients. That won't be the case. Smart 911? Sounds pretty, doesn't it? Well, it's great. So we're going to have you make a phone call, give me your medications, your social security number, your allergies, your insurance numbers, 
and every six months you have to call me back and put that back in or I'm going to boot you out of the system. It sounds beautiful, but the patients that need it, they might not have the money. They might not have computers. They might not have internet access. With what we've done at AMR, we have our Meds4 program, which we actually input patient data. And if we take a patient a second time, inputting a couple of pieces of data, it brings up all the medications we had previously. The health insurance, the primary care physician, their allergies. We didn't advertise that because it's just what we do. It was above the minimum, but we didn't know what you were asking for. So, and the <coughs> patients don't have to have internet access. They don't have to have a computer for us to actually have that. It's automatic. It doesn't matter if you're a homeless gentleman, a drug addict that might be just visiting the city several times, or the cardiac arrest patient. We bring your name up. If we've taken you once before, we have that information. So you don't have to call us every six months. It's just what we've had previously. So we've tried to be progressive. We've tried to do the best for the city. And I'm proud to say that my colleagues have done great. We've got several people who've won national awards for the service. We had a couple of providers who were instrumental in the care of patients at the marathon bombing. But to get a few people to get awards wasn't you know, required. These people aren't heroes. They were doing their jobs. That's just what we do. So. I guess my concern is, you know, by preserving public safety, as the mayor stated, how is that happening? We're going to a new system, new amounts of trucks, new configurations, with all new providers. Come, you know, 1201, July 1st, my concern is somebody's going to get hurt. And it's a disservice to the people that will be working those trucks to put them in that situation. My request is that somehow you check into the city charter to see if there's any way you can request a revisit, a relook at what is actually in the best interest of the city. We do have several cards that we had signed by constituents of yours, uh, well over a thousand, that we'd like to present to you folks and just ask you, you know, maybe you could have a conversation with the mayor and say, why not AMR? You said so several times it was. But you don't make a decision going against all of your experts and all of your citizens and all of the people you've impaneled without having some sort of reason behind it. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I want to thank all of those that uh, spoke before us. Councilor Sullivan. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for uh, some leniency there. I, again, I think the intent of the resolve was to, uh, to educate. Um, you know, I had been asked to file this resolve, and again, I think it's the right thing to do. And we definitely got some ed education that I, I, for one, wasn't aware of uh, relative to response time and the like. Um, so again, I want to thank the, the men and women that spoke tonight. I want to thank all the representatives from A&R for being here. I want to thank you for your 34 years of uh, being champions within our city of champions. Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Dubois, you were... You, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You, you wanted to say um, something? I would just like to say that I've been highly critical of this decision um, by Mayor Carpenter to switch the ambulance services, so I'm in full agreement with all of you here this evening. And I'm sorry you don't have to clap, because we've got to keep this moving, but... Thank you very much. Um, we, I really think that for me, I just want to make it clear that um, I feel as though that this is another example of playing fast and loose with public safety. And I'm extremely concerned.
concerned about response time and the ability of ambulance that don't have a lot of experience in the city being able to get to my constituents, the ones that I represent as city councilor, those in Ward 6, and Ward 6 has a huge elderly population of people, and I know that the ambulance service combined with the fire department saved my father's life several times when he had strokes and heart attacks because they were there quicker than even the neighbor in some regards. Um, definitely were there before I got there, and my mom called me at like 3 a.m., and I got right in my car, and I was there, and I lived two blocks away. So um, I am extremely concerned about that, and um, I, I think I would be less concerned if the way it occurred seemed to be um, fairer and um, more uh, transparent. And I'm extremely concerned that our fire chief is against this move. Um, I'm one to think that the person that is actually responsible and on the scene should be the person that should be making the decision. And I find it, um, it's just disheartening, and I don't think it's in the spirit of the City of Champions, that we don't listen to the fire chief when he says that for public safety reasons, he thinks we should stay with one service over another. Uh, to me, that's the answer that everybody should be listening to. And I'm really concerned with it. I don't know what we can do as a city council, but myself as a city councilor and um, now a state representative will try to help as much as I can. And I'm sorry that you're all in this situation. And just to, just to add to that, so those are all the reasons that I'm upset about it, really, in my professional capacity. Um, but I'm also upset because we're going from a union um, ambulance service to a non-union ambulance service. And I'm a big supporter of unions, and I find that very <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Council Bonds. You had a comment you wanted to make? I did. I, I actually question. had a question just to get a little bit more information on some of the presentations. And I'm not sure if I should ask Ron or um, the young lady, Ms. Hort Horte, to come forward just with some background questions, really, on, on some of the things that you'd mentioned. And thank you for coming uh, forward and, and sharing that information. And, and as my brother said, I, I learned a lot about, you know, a little bit more intimate uh, workings of AMR and what you've done for the city for the, you know, last three plus decades. Uh, You're welcome. You said that there are about 100 AMR workers right now. Okay, how many did we start 34 years ago? How many were, were in service, I guess, then? In 1981, when we came into Brockton, uh, we actually had... Oh, about 36 employees total. Okay, okay. So there's been significant growth in, in finding places for people to go and working <coughs> them into the fabric of the city. Yes, and as the population grew, mm -hmm. we had to come in with more and more trucks, and then <coughs> we had to get more and more providers certified at different levels. Because when we started Brockton, it was basically just basic life support. Put a patch on and take them to the hospital. Mm -hmm. But we grew that system into paramedic care, mm -hmm. and that's where we're at. And addressing some of the, the changes in the, the cases that you see when you arrive to the scenes, correct? Yes, okay. yes. And uh, you mentioned that over the years there have been alterations in service, and with the contracts that you've had, every time there's been a change, you've been able to, to kind of alter the service that you provide. If you can just maybe kind of go into that a little bit more. And, and just kind of share with the folks on how you have done that with the, um, the gentleman there. You spoke about the automated uh, chair lifts and those kinds of things. Can you just go into a little bit more of how you've changed how you operate to fit what we've asked you to do? Um, yeah, and what I was referring to was um, specifically configuration of ambulances. I okay. know when I started here 16 years ago, um, I believe there were two or three ambulances dedicated um, to the city for 911. We're at four now. Um, we found over the years, again, like Ron said, the increase in population. Um, we know that medical field has made a lot of advances. Um, they diagnose more things. They treat more things. So, of course, we have patients that maybe 10, 20 years ago might have had illnesses that they didn't know about because they were undiagnosed. So now that there are so many diagnoses out there and so many different treatments, life-saving treatments, um, we found that we've had to, as far as configuration of ambulances and adding more ambulances, it, it just to keep up with the number of calls, mm -hmm. um, we have to do that. Um, some of the equipment, like we said, we, they're stair chairs. Um, we have a lot of triple-deckers 
in the city. We have right. a lot of high rises. Um, sometimes the elevators don't work right. and we have to go to the 10th floor. Um, thankfully, in cases like those, they have very clean, very straight staircases. <laughs> in the high ride, in the triple deckers we go to, they're not always like that. And they turn. They're terrible. Right. Um, we had stair chairs that were, you know, a little flimsy. They were hard to maneuver around that. Um, they work. We make them work. You know, with the fire department and our crews, we get the patient down safely. We have looked into the need for safer equipment. And one of the things that we recently got were new stair chairs. And what Marty was talking about is they have treads on them. So when you have a nice clean stairway, instead of having to lift the patient on both ends mm -hmm. and carry that weight down, no matter what that weight might be, mm -hmm. you can fold out the treads. And one person stands at the top of the chair, one person supports the bottom, and you actually kind of slide them down the stairs. So that's easier and safer for the patient. Okay. And that's um, safer for the provider. Okay. as well. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to highlight that, if I just may just very uh, shortly, I just wanted to highlight that to make sure that everyone can hear um, how we've worked together as as partners um, in this and, and with the public safety and with uh, saving of lives. And I've not had to use AMR service very often, which I'm very, very grateful for. Um, but when my loved ones and family members have needed to uh, to use your services, you all were there, you were, you were very knowledgeable. You were um, sympathetic to, to my needs, to my family's needs, while our loved one was going through their, their trauma. And I wanted to um, just say that I support you all. I wrote a letter of support you know, when, when I was asked to, and I support your endeavor. And um, thank you very much for, for being in our city and for saving our, our residents. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Council. Any other uh, questions or concerns from my uh, fellow councilors? Councilor Sullivan? Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to again thank everybody for coming here tonight, and I, I want to make a favorable recommendation back to the full City Council. Second. Motion from made and second to send back to the uh, full City Council with a favorable recommendation. All in favor? Opposed goes back to the uh, full City Council. Thank you, and we thank you all for uh, being here this, uh, this evening. We'll take a five minute recess.
No, I do not. <coughs> Call the City Council Finance Committee uh, meeting back uh, to order. <coughs> Madam Clerk, uh, item number 21. Resolved that Mr. John Williams be invited to appear before the Finance Committee to discuss his educational mentoring program, Champion City, and to fully detail the success and proven benefits provided to the student participants, invited John Williams, Executive Director. Mr. So Chairman. Council Sullivan. Uh, I just want to first of all say that I, I filed this resolve in conjunction and uh, it was co-signed by my colleague, Council Lodge Shana Bonds. I saw Mr. Williams recently actually at a Brockton youth soccer game on a Saturday and uh, hadn't seen John in a while, and many of us know him when he when he sought uh, public office uh, a while ago. He's uh, really a, a, a great guy, a good asset in the city of Brockton, and he told me about the mentoring program, and uh, I hadn't heard of it as a counselor at large serving the whole city, so I thought it would be appropriate to have John come here, and as you recall, a few weeks ago when the superintendent, uh, Superintendent Lopes from Southeastern Regional was here, I mentioned uh, John had done, uh, through his program, some wonderful things over there, uh, and, uh, and that no longer exists. And uh, <coughs> Superintendent Lopes uh, gave kudos and accolades to Mr. Williams. So that being, being said, John, thank you for coming tonight. The floor thank is you. yours. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for having me today. Uh, I want to speak on a program, Champion City Mentor Program, which exists here in Brockton and uh, is contracted with the Brockton Public Schools. Uh, we started as a volunteer program. It, it really wasn't even a program. I'm a Brockton kid. I grew up here. I was raised here. Uh, got into some trouble uh, and reformed my life. And in doing so, one of the things that really uh, touched me to change uh, was that I saw some younger guys from my neighborhood. I grew up right over on the east side. I saw some younger guys from my neighborhood. I had just come home from prison and I was at the East Side Market getting a drink. And one of the kids saw me. He was like, hey, what's up? And he reminded me of some of the things that I had done prior to going to prison and returning back to the community. And the way that he said it, uh, and the way that he glorified some of the things, just didn't sit well with me. And it gave me an understanding that if I could affect someone in a negative way. I could affect someone in a positive way. And from that point, I volunteered for numerous organizations in the city, uh, the Brockton Peace Crusaders, uh, and also just personally uh, at schools and, and programs to help young people. And during a time uh, just after my father passed in 2012, I was in a space where I was unsure of what I wanted to do. I had just left uh, the Safe Corners program, which is uh, a program through the YMCA, a street outreach program through the YMCA in the city of Brockton. And I was unsure of what I wanted to do. And I approached uh, Balbina Cardozo from Gateway to College, which is an alternative program at Massasoit Community College. And I used to speak there uh, every once in a while and I, I offered to do a group, a 13-week group that would go through each semester for the young males there because she expressed to me that she was getting a high number of male applicants that they were accepting into the program, much higher than the females. But at graduation, there were a much uh, larger number of female graduates than there were male graduates. And where this program was, uh, had a high uh, rate of minority males in the program, I felt that I could assist in some way with this group. So we started the group in the fall of 2012. Uh, I currently still volunteer to do that group over at uh, Massasoit's Gateway to College program. Uh, and we've branched out a bit since then. In 2013, we were invited to Southeastern Regional and, uh, by Gwen Nalls, who was a guidance counselor there. And we came in to just do what we did at Gateway to College, which was 13-week group session with some young men that they had identified as needing supplemental support within the school. And we started working with them in groups. And it just developed uh, because of the relationships that we established 
with these young men and how it was helping them academically, uh, in their behavior, and in their attendance, they asked me to come on and do and provide more services for them. So we actually uh, developed a program specifically for those students. And uh, from the original eight students, the program grew to over 30 uh, mem actual members of the Champion City Mentor Program. Uh, from there, we had uh, over 50 engagements with students. So there were 30 students that we actually brought into the program. Over 50 engagements, meaning that we've had at least one sit-down, one-on-one conversation with, with the student. And we had hundreds of just pure contacts of, hi, how you doing? Uh, you shouldn't be doing that in the hallway. And we established a real presence within Southeastern. Uh, I myself have volunteered to help coach their basketball team over the summer, which developed into me becoming the freshman head coach of their uh, basketball team and the assistant varsity coach of their basketball team. Prior to that, I was the assistant for two years over at Massasoit. Uh, from the initial students that we had, we only had one out of the, the initial 10 students that we, we had from the, uh, 2000, the end of the 2013 year. One of them had ever made honor roll at a time that they were at Southeastern. The, next, the following semester, we had over 50% of our program make the honor roll. Uh, from that initial group, there was a freshman who was a CDF <laughs> student, and he finished his freshman year with uh, three C's in, an F, uh, in a D, sorry, and passed his freshman year, went through our summer program, and after that summer program, he had been on the honor roll every single semester. And uh, this December, our program had been cut from Southeastern, and in the two semesters since we haven't been in the school, this student has uh, fe fa fallen off of the honor roll. Um, he has a C plus instead of the B, but that just shows one of the important roles that we serve for these young men. Because once I, once I recognize that your grade has dropped below a B level, I'm coming to you. I love it. I'm coming to you in the hallway, I'm coming to you at lunch, I'm calling, coming to you in the classroom, I'm coming to you at home, I'm coming to you when I drive by you in the street and say, that C has to come up. And the effect that it's had, we, and I, I want to move beyond Southeastern because we're not there anymore, but the effects that, that it's had on these young men have been so tremendous that these young men that couldn't be engaged in school now continue to come to my program without any obligation, just solely on them wanting to come and seeing the benefit of interacting with our program. We have now uh, moved into the Brockton Public School System. Uh, we initially uh, came in contact with the Brockton Public School System because of the new 38, 37 H and a half law, which changed, saying that you cannot just send home teachers to students who are removed from school because they have a felony. Now they have to be provided a service, and part of that service is the Champion City Mentor Tour Program, and we work in conjunction with the Brockton Public Schools on, on the academic side. And we are proud to say that we, out of the two seniors that we had in our program this year, both of them have graduated. Uh, and one came to us in about March and was on track. He just needed a couple of things uh, that, that we provided for him. But uh, one student specifically who was from the, the East Side Housing Project, uh, I can honestly say that if not for the interaction that he had with our program, we don't know if he would have walked across that stage uh, this, this spring. And, and we are so glad that he has. And he's uh, on track to go to Massasoit Community College and wants to transfer to UMass Boston in two years uh, for psychology. And 
now we've, we've also gone into the Hancock School and West Middle School and we, we are going to look to provide services to the middle schools uh, next year as well as uh, some elementary uh, schools if we can negotiate that. Uh, and our program has also contact, had contact with David uh, Bigba over at the Head Start and we're looking to do something over there. Uh, I volunteered over there. My son uh, just graduated from Head Start and I volunteered over there on a weekly basis to walk, to go into his class and we just <laughs> naturally developed a rapport with the male students in that class so we're looking to, to do something there. So we're, we're looking at creating a, a situation where we have a program that is mentoring young males and females. We've, we've had some females come into the program as well. But we can have a young male that we get at age three, four, five years old and take him all the way through high school. And we can break some cycles. Uh, I know on the invitation it said to fully detail success and proven benefits provided by my program. Um, it, it's very hard to prove what we've done with some of these students. But I just wanted to uh, take a little bit of time to read what some feedback from some of the school uh, administrators and the school workers, staff that have been in contact with our program. Um, uh, this is David Joseph, a guidance counselor at Southeastern. He had begun to say that uh, a stool needs at least three legs to stand and supports need to be in place for that stool to stand. And then he goes on to say, this is an easy way of describing Champion City Mentor Program. The hard way would be to describe how John Williams and Linda Texera, who is with me here today, who has uh, been working with the program since its inception, uh, take each child under their umbrella to help the student develop their own tools. They help the student see the big picture. They help the student identify the importance of character. And they help the student understand that they do not settle, do not have to settle for anything in life. They are able to do this because they know the community and they get to know their students as individuals. They put every resource they have into helping these children. They teach the students the value of holding themselves account accountable for their actions through hard work, dedication, and genuine belief in the potential of every student to be successful regardless of their situation or past mistakes. This is Jill DeMello, an, assess an adjustment counselor at Southeastern Regional uh, Vocational. I've had the pleasure of working with Champion City Mentor Program for the last year. It has been such a relief and pleasure to work with John Williams and his staff in supporting our at-risk students. John's no-nonsense approach is refreshing and necessary for our students. He has been consistently available to our students to identify their goals understand what is inhibiting their potential, challenge them, and hold them accountable, all while develop, uh, developing a wonderfully warm and supportive relationship with them. His style and background make him a unique addition to Southeastern and give him the ability to connect with our students in a way that others cannot. <laughs> Kathy Zing, uh, the speech and language pathologist, uh, I've had the opportunity to work with John and Linda in troubleshooting, problem solving, and putting in place supports and programs to allow students at risk for failure, <clears throat> both in school and in life, to reassess their choices and commit to new positive choices. When a student is brought forth to John and Linda, they always go to work without delay, speaking with teachers, students, and families to get the ball rolling. They then begin the hard work of turning failing grades, lack of engagement, and lack of goals around, meeting with students daily whenever needed. They inspire and expect students to be the best they can be, and they help those students become goal-driven, not only for themselves, but for their families and communities as well. And this is Gwen Knowles, who is a guidance counselor at Southeastern. <clears throat> the effect of the program on the students is evident right away, but at the same time, the students are a work in progress. They, ha they are learning to change their thought pattern, break generational cycles, and believe in themselves. 
Also, the students are being taught in addition to other tools to give back to their communities through community service, which includes mentoring younger relatives and eventually reaching out to their peers in the community. Home visits help to personalize <clears throat> the program that develops their mind and a healthy lifestyle. Uh, I rarely come out and promote my program. Uh, we've done all of this. We grew from, like I said, eight students at Southeastern to over uh, 30 members and over 50 contacts just from word of mouth. Uh, I, I, I don't promote it too much. I feel like the work speaks for itself in what we do and uh, that this will be a great supplement. And that's all we are, a supplement. We're a supplement to the schools. We're a medium for families to be in contact with the schools and for schools to be in contact with the families, for students to be to develop a better rapport with their teachers and vice versa and, and guidance. We, we are only a supplement, but the results that we are getting with uh, these students are tremendous and it has also been a learning process for myself and my staff working with the school system and the school departments and guidance counselors and teachers getting to get a better understanding of what it is that we do and how to interact with young people because it is those young people that are going to be the future of our city. It is those young people that are going to be sitting in your seats one day, sitting in the mayor's office one day, that are going to be uh, voting one day in developing our city and carrying our city into the future. Thank you very much for your time. Mr. Thank Chairman. You thank you, Mr. Williams. Job well done. Thank you. Mr. Thank Chairman, um, I want to thank Mr. Williams. I'm sure my colleagues understand uh, what John just uh, explained to us is what he explained to me at the soccer field that Saturday and I was blown away. He's making a true impact on the lives of our youth, a, a true success, John, and I want to just publicly thank you for what you're doing thank and you. keep it up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor, Councilor Bond, you had a question? I did. Thank you. Uh, yes, John, thank you so much. And um, I just wanted to, because when people hear this, they you might you know, spark some interest mm -hmm. from other students that may not have been on your radar. So how are students selected um, to be in the program? Are they referred to you or how does that work? They're referred. Uh, right now with the 37 H and a half uh, program, mm -hmm. unfortunately to get into that program they would have to have a felony, felony. Okay. and be kicked out of school. But uh, we've, we're developing it in a way now. Uh, we're grabbing some of those rising students, the students coming from elementary rising into middle school and the students rising from middle school to high school uh, that guidance and school administration have identified as having issues, either behavioral issues, uh, attendance issues, or just underperforming academically. And we're, we're not looking for the students that are uh, just not able to do the work. Mm -hmm. We're looking for the ones that are underperforming, the ones that uh, the schools have identified and can see they can perform at a higher level. They're just not for some reason, whether it be a home issue mm -hmm. or they may have some issues in school or just a personal issue. Mm -hmm. we, we look to work with those students and they're referred through either guidance, teachers, and then eventually the administration of the school. And now um, you said it's you and, and Ms. Texera here. How yes. many other people work with you in your program? Uh, we have uh, two others, uh, Jamie Andrade, who has been doing street outreach in our city forever, mm -hmm. going way back to my turn and before that even the PIC program, uh, the, the RISE program. And Richard Johnson, who works at the Champion High School and the B.B. Russell, uh, who is a Brockton High School uh, football legend <laughs> in his own right. He works with us as well. Okay. And uh, projecting forward, mm -hmm. what, what do you see this program being? How do you see it developing you know, in two, three years? Or, or what, what do you see the future for this program here? I see, first of all, our students that graduate coming back and, and giving back. Mm -hmm. And hopefully uh, we will be at a, in a situation where we can even employ them. Uh, but I see our, our program reaching out to more young people and creating a web almost, a network of students who help one another so that when they come into the room 
It's not one of the things I always say is when we come into the room as young males, and specifically young minority males, we are quick to say, what is my difference from him? <coughs> and Please. instead, I would like for them to come into the room and see a network because it's, it's, this is less of a program and more of a family. Mm -hmm. And bringing the programs together, whether they came from Southeastern, Gateway, or the Brockton Public School System, when we come and have our summer program, everyone's together. And they've learned the same principles. We have four core principles to Champion City. Honesty, loyalty, honor, and respect. And when they come together and say, and see, wait, you know honesty, loyalty, honor, respect, and the five Ps, proper preparation prevents poor performance. Mm -hmm. Things like that, uh, the seven ha habits of highly successful people. And they see that they've learned the same things as others, and they can put it together. I, I see a, a network growing of young people that are looking to do positive things and instill a positive culture within their circles instead of the negative, violent culture that permeates our city. Right. And, and in an effort to, I guess, um, supplement the shameless promoting, mm -hmm. you've recently been uh, tapped for a national award of some kind. <laughs> I, I, if you could just maybe share that with the council and the folks at home. <laughs> Uh, the Boy Scouts of America uh, have uh, chosen me. Actually, the, the previous year's winner has, has uh, nominated me for uh, the Whitney Young Award for uh, being a distinguished citizen in, in Brockton and in, in giving my services to the city, uh, which I, I fully appreciate uh, and, and I, I, I'm humbled by it. Well deserved, well deserved. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Councilor Council Moynihan. Yes, hey, John, how are you doing? Good. Thank you. How are you? Who was the previous year's winner of that? Oh, this. <laughs> Councilor oh. Barnes. Oh. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> well, I've known John for a little while, and I actually know his wife. I actually yeah. taught her CCD, so I'm sure you're mentoring her because she was a handful. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I'm sure she'll say I'm the handful. But I just. You only have four on your staff now, and there's got to be more kids that really need this type of mentoring. Absolutely. So are you, are you going to be expanding? Is it, is it just a, uh, right now you're working with just a few, but are you seeing it expanding and expanding your staff? Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and we will as, as funding allows, you know, uh, for us to expand. We really want to be um, in conjunction with the school system, but hopefully in the future we could be more community-based because we get, uh, I know when I was at South, Southeastern, a lot of the time I, I would meet parents, you know, in the streets who would see me and say, look, I, can you work with my child? And it was, well, I don't have a contract with your child's school. And we want to be more community-based. We want to have more staff. We want to be able to make this a program to where we can service more individuals, but in the right way. So, so we have to uh, wait for the funding to come to allow for that. Okay, yes. I think we really can use this program and expand it. Thank Thanks you. a lot, John. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Councillor uh, Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, I want to thank my colleague, uh, Mr. Sullivan, for bringing this to our <coughs> attention and to everyone in Brockton and to uh, John Williams, Mr. Williams, for your work. And I can attest to your street credibility because that's how we met. On the, yes, I don't sir. remember in 2006 or seven, we bumped into each other on the south side and um, known each other since. So Dover congratulations street. on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so are you guys a uh, nonprofit? What's the structure of the, of the group? No, it's, it's a for-profit business. Um, I, I didn't want to go the nonprofit route after working for a lot of nonprofits <laughs> and seeing how programs kind of change to the <coughs> grant funding that's Excuse available. Uh, I didn't want to change the structure of this program because being someone that's from Brockton, um, not to uh, seem too egotistical, but I feel like I, I, in working in this field for so long and doing this, um, I have a solid view of what needs to be done in regards to the mentoring aspect. And being an individual who has bent that corner and, and made that change, I feel like I can recognize what needs to be done for some of the students and they, I need that, uh, that breath to do so. And sometimes uh, the nonprofit route and the grant route is constricting. 
and it can constrict what you can actually do with some of these young people. And then, um, so Champion City, and I yes. vaguely remember um, a rap song called Champion City. Yes. So is that, so tell me, is that connected and? It, it, it is, it is uh, connected. Um, the, the song Champion City actually was about uh, my struggle to, to change and, and the things that I did to overcome the obstacles uh, in my life. And there was a young man, Black Mozart, from Montreal that was also on that song, uh, which was on the mixtape Champion City. And if you know the mixtape Champion City, you've been in contact with John Williams for a little bit now. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that, that came from the mixtape Champion City. This has actually been... Uh, an idea of mine for a long time to do something. It started out as just how can I create a medium to connect different uh, entities within the community? And then it developed into a mentoring pro program as one aspect of Champion City. Right. Well, thank you, Mr. Williams, for your commitment to the city. Thank you, Mr. Chepperson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilor Seward. Uh, any other questions by any other council? Council Sullivan? Mr. Chairman, I want to make a uh, favorable recommendation back to the full Second. council. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to uh, send this back to the full city council with a favorable recommendation. All in favor? Opposed? Goes back to, a, to the full city council with a favorable <coughs> recommendation. Thank you and thank you for all that you do. Appreciate thank it very much. Job. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Last item uh, is number 22, which is um, order which is called for the budget of uh, FY um, 2016. And, and councilors, just about uh, 14, 15 days ago, we were here and we started deliberating the, uh, the budget for fiscal year 2016 to the tune of 384,173,386. That is before us um, this evening. And what is before us is if um, you wish to start to make um, any deliberation or discussion in regards to anything that you feel needs to be um, reduced. As you all know, we can only reduce the budget. We cannot add to it. So if there's anybody that uh, thinks that they want to do that now, we, we may. And if not, um, it can move forward to full council. And I believe at the same time next Monday evening, we could also do some other elimination if we felt so. Councilor Cruz. Uh, yes, uh, I actually have a uh, cut I'd like to make a motion on. Sure. I uh, hereby move to reduce from the Law Department Ordinary Maintenance Services account by $100,000. The appropriation in that account is reduced from 562477 to 462477 uh, Just if you recall, uh, this budget actually was uh, put in before we uh, as a council uh, have changed the ordinance, which has, still has one more reading, but to add uh, uh, more full time to the, uh, to the office. So. Uh, I felt like uh, we, we should be safe, and I've talked it over with Mr. Nezrella, to uh, take $100,000 out of the outside purchases of, of, uh, of law services, and uh, we we're adding some full-time people to the office. So uh, that's my motion. Second. Motion's been made and seconded that we um, eliminate $100,000. I just want to see that so I have the right to... Thank you. Man. So we are uh, removing from the ordinary maintenance service from the law department uh, by $100,000, which means we're reducing the, uh, the figure from the 562,477 to 462,477. Motion was made. Was there a second? Yes. Second. Yes. Motion was made and seconded all that. All in favor? Opposed? That passes. Anybody? Council Rodriguez. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I too would like to uh, submit a, um, a cut. I hereby move to reduce from the DPW Water Commission Department in the other category, D cell fixed charges, account by 6,395,630 the appropriation in that account is to be reduced from 6,395,631 to one dollar. Second. Second. Mr. Second. Chairman, the reason why I'm submitting this is in lieu of the lack of professional courtesy and respect afforded to this council by Aquaria, and I see this council as the representative of the people of this, com of this community. 
Therefore, I'm submitting this request, and I asked my counselors to support this, uh, this reduction until such time that this company actually does gain some, um, some professional courtesy to this body. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank Chair. you, Council. The motion was made and seconded. Could I just have that before me so that I have the right uh, point of information, Mr. Chairperson? Councilor Stewart. Uh, just to clarify, um, so um, this would be cut until the company behaves more appropriately. So I'm not understanding of the rules exactly. Once the budget is cut, is that not permanent or no? For this fiscal year, um, <laughs> I would. Uh, yeah, I think, Mr. Condon, I just have to have you to uh, make clarification of that. I don't want to. Even no has the objection. Uh, the the answer to your question depends upon whether the appropriation is coming from estimated revenues or from a reserve fund. Uh, if it's coming from a reserve fund, uh, uh, such as free cash, the ability to use that fund expires at the end of the month of June. However, this particular appropriation is coming from estimated revenues, so it could be restored at any time up until the time you set the tax rate. Thank you, Mr. Conner. Okay, so a motion was made in second end that we are reducing from the DPW Water Commission Department, which would be other, which is the desal fixed charges, the account by six million three hundred ninety-five thousand six hundred and thirty, six million to uh, three hundred ninety-five thousand six hundred thirty-one to uh, one dollar, and that motion was made and seconded. Mr. Chairman, Councilor Rodriguez on the motion. I would like to have a roll call on that, please. <coughs> Request of a roll call vote, which we can uh, we can do. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll on this particular budget item? Shirley, oh, she's not here. Shana Barnes. No. Timothy Cruz. No. Dennis DiNapoli. Yes. Michelle Dubois. Yes. Dennis Ianeri. Yes. Tom Monahan. No. Moises Rodriguez. Yes. Jazz Stewart. Yes. Paul Studensky. Yes. Robert Sullivan. Yes. Seven yeas, three nays. The order, um, the order passes. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Person, Councilor Stewart. I'd like to request to have uh, an official notice sent to a query that this, that this vote was made, please. And we can uh, make sure that that, uh, that happens as well. <coughs> we will make sure. Councilor Dubois. Offer, um, yes. Once I make the cut, if I get a second, could I ask Mr. Condon where this funding comes from and see if we can reappropriate those dollars? When yes. Yes we, yes, we can. We, Mr. Condon, see to answer those questions. So I hereby move to reduce from the library department personnel services other than overtime uh, account by $89,238. The appropriation in the account reduced from 89239 I think maybe I'm using the actual salary. The re my motivation is that we have the department before us. I'm hearing nothing but rumors about absentee, no-show jobs being handed out, and no one will answer our questions. So until we find out if there's someone working as a department head, we should not be funding that salary. So I would like to make a move to cut that salary, and I guess I should be asking um, uh, Mark Gilday, Attorney Gilday, am I supposed to be cutting the actual salary or should I be looking at the bottom number? Should be okay. 1.5 million? Okay. So I'm going to... I'm almost done. I'm sorry to hold you up. <coughs> All right, I'm ready. So I will read it again. I hereby move to reduce the library department personnel services other than overtime by $89,000. $238, reduced from $1,520,383 to 
$431,145. Motion's been made. Uh, Chair, we have a second. Second. Motion's been made and seconded on the motion. <coughs> Mr. Stewart. Chair, just so I, I for, for clarification, so my understanding is when we propose cuts to a particular budget um, unit, I guess, that it's within the discretion of that department to determine how those cuts are made, correct? And, and that is correct. So we can't designate that a specific person or particular item you, you, are, you are correct. You cannot, and you cannot touch a line item. You're, you're just going to that department, and then they make the discretion of where they may take it from. Okay, I, I asked that question because I understand the intent of my colleague, um, which I may or may not agree with. But I want to make certain that we understand that the department may choose to, uh, to lay off other individuals. Um, or individuals, not, yeah, or, exactly. or services within that department, not necessarily what we're trying to accomplish. But that—that that is what transpires, and I think Mr. Condon would agree with me. It, it is what it is how it works, Mr. Condon. If you want to, yes. Uh, with respect to Councilor Dubois' question, this is a an appropriation from estimated receipts, and so you know, if the cut can be made and restored later if the council so chooses and the mayor appropriates it. Right. With respect to Councillor Stewart's question, <coughs> I believe in this particular case uh, the cut could not be used in the way the councillor intends because I think there's some kind of an agreement which is in place to protect the one position. So if it's a cut that stands into the next fiscal year, there would be a problem in not having sufficient salaries in the library budget to maintain its staff. Yeah, Second ahead. problem would be that the budget <coughs> is funded at the <coughs> minimum amount necessary to uh, get paid the mass uh, incentive grant for libraries. Now we'd have some time to get that rectified as well, but th those would be the two consequences I can think of. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Counsel, uh, um, Counsel Mr. Carter, if you just wait one minute. So just to repeat what you said, um, you know what's happening, but us folks up here, and you're definitely fiscally responsible for this, for this city, and I understand that, but we also have a fiduciary responsibility. And if I believe that there's some sort of, you know, mismanagement and I'm not able to get answers to questions that I'm looking for even during the budget process, if this cut goes through, the mayor has the opportunity to let the public and us know what is going on with department heads um, being paid not to come to work and then we can reappropriate this money for whatever purpose that we want to do. So it isn't like if we vote no on this now, there's no fixing it later. It's really just a stick in order to actually get information that should be shared with us anyways. Well, we there, there may, I'm sorry, Councilor, I thought you were finished. There may, there may be a problem with fixing it later if later is July 1st or beyond mm -hmm. that but not before July 1st because the budget doesn't take effect until July 1st. But if the cut is made and there isn't an ability to reduce the part of the budget that you're targeting, it means that the amount of budget that's left over isn't sufficient. I don't think I'd have to look. There might be some vacancies getting filled. If that's the case, you've got some leeway. But it might not be sufficient to pay everybody who's on payroll as of July 1st. So that would be the danger. Thank you very much. I would like a roll call vote, please. Mo okay, just let me go back so we're all on the right, uh, right page here. So a motion was made and seconded that we move to reduce from the library department personal services other than overtime in, in the account for 89238 to 1 million, is it 1 million, uh, uh, I can't read that other number there? 431,000. Or oh, 521,000. Bring it to a total of one million four hundred and thirty one thousand one hundred and forty five. Correct? Yes. Okay. Motion was made and second on that. Roll call vote. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll on this item? Shana Barnes. Yes. Timothy Cruz. No. Dennis DiNapoli. Yes. Michelle Dubois. Yes. Dennis Ioneri. No. Tom Monahan. No. Moses Rodriguez. Yes. Jazz Stewart. No. Paul Studensky. No. Robert Sullivan. Yes. Five to five. The order fails. Do we have any other? Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I have one, a proposed cut. Councilor Barnes. Okay. I hereby move to reduce from the Mayor's Department and personal services other than overtime account by $11,562. The appropriation in the account is reduced from $493,644 to $482,102. Second. 
Motion's been made and seconded on that item. If I could have that. <laughs> Councilor, thank you, just so we're all on the right. Do I have to give a reason? Or? Okay. <laughs> Again, um, motion was made and seconded that we reduce <coughs> the mayor's department personal services other than overtime account by 11,562, which reduces it um, uh, from the 493,664 to 482,102. A motion was made and seconded. Chairman, I'd like a roll call on that, please. Roll call vote on that uh, particular item as well, Madam Clerk, please. Shana Barnes. Yes. Timothy Cruz. No. Dennis DiNapoli. Yes. Michelle Dubois. Yes. Dennis Annery. No. Tom Monaghan. No. Moses Rodriguez. No. Jazz Stewart. No. Paul Studensky. Yes. Robert Sullivan. Absolutely, yes. Five to five. Five to five. <laughs> the order fails. Could do it again next week. Do we have any other? Uh, yeah. Mr. President, will we be able to make cuts next week? You, you can. Yes. We, will be able, we will be able to reduce again next week. What we'll do at this point in time, we move the budget uh, at this. We will we'll send it back to the full city council, and then we can uh, make whatever changes that necessarily, uh, if anyone wants to make any changes, then. Can I ask for a roll call vote on the referral? On back to the full city, uh, back to the full city council. Can you take a five minute, two minute recess? Yeah, let me just take a uh, two minute recess. What is she wanna do?
So when you write it, Mr. President. The City Council Finance Meeting back to order. Council Dubois. I'm sorry. Um, I would like to withdraw my request for a roll call vote on this budget. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you Council. Councilors, now in front of us is the, the budget for FY 2016 as amended to go back to the full City Council. All in favor? Opposed goes back to the uh, full City Council um, as amended. Now we'll hear the budget again next. Monday night at City Council meeting, June 22nd, here at 8 p.m. And if anybody wants to do any other further deliberation, you have every, every right to do so. And at that point, then we will move, move forward uh, to get it to uh, begin uh, on the next uh, fiscal year. Uh, Councilor Studinsky, moment yeah. of personal privilege. From over personal Could privilege. Councilor Bond, sit down. I want to let everybody know. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know which one. No, I'm always. 7 p.m. A lot at large are all invited. Anybody's invited. Uh, there'll be some topics that I think everybody wants to join in or look at it, hear about it. There always is mm -hmm. down in the fight and forth. Could Thank you me. repeat it again? Okay. That's tomorrow evening at what time? School, 7, 7 p.m. Davis School. 7 p.m. at the Davis School Ward 4 uh, meeting tomorrow evening. Any other uh, Councilor Sullivan? Mr. Chairman, I want to uh, recognize the, the boys and girls, the students at the Brookfield Elementary School, myself and State Rep Council Dubois, Councilor at, at Large Rodriguez, Councilor at Large Stewart, and, and Councilor Denapoli. We attended a, a wonderful event. It's the Choose to Be Nice event today. Um, the, the kids were great. The teachers were great. We took the pledge. Uh, and it was, uh, it was a wonderful day, and, and Principal uh, Valerie Brower had indicated that it's going to be an annual thing. So I want to thank my colleagues for being there. And Council Dubois said some wonderful things, but real, really it's uh, a thank you to the boys and girls that make up the Brookfield. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council. Any other, uh, any other business to come before the uh, Finance Committee this evening? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned.